What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am. Today I've got a compilation of a bunch of Reddit videos that cover everything from Karen's freaking out over birthday cakes to people trying to burn down a mobile home park because their Chipotle order was wrong. Thought you guys would enjoy it. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's hop right into it. Alright, what's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the subreddit Tales from Retail, which is basically people dealing with uh, Karens, you know, of, of all types and varieties. And just overall other stories that suck when you're working retail, so I figured it would be something y'all are going to enjoy. But before we get into it, if you uh, like these long Reddit videos, like and comment. And before uh, I can talk anymore, let's get into it. If you're rude and refuse to pay, we have the right to refuse services, even after they're done. So I was in the shop one day and a customer was getting some keys copied. A nice and simple job, and suddenly while I've got the machine running, some shirtless guy comes in looking frantic, and I tell him I'll just be a minute longer, and then I finish the keys and send the first customer on his way. Jeez, it took you long enough. I need you to come unlock my car. I'm already a little annoyed since it's almost closing time, but I figured he's just a kid or, you know, got a kid or dog or groceries in the car and give him the benefit of the doubt. All right, no problem. Where is it? A couple miles that way. My girlfriend drove me over here. You can follow us to it. I get some info from him, the kind of car it is, his name, number, address, in case we get separated, and he says, my phone's in the car, so if you call it, I won't answer. And I say, well, then how about your girlfriend's number? Well, hers is in the car, too. All right, then. Since it's pretty much closing time, I just go ahead and set the alarm and lock the doors as I leave, and he doesn't like this and starts saying how I'm taking forever. Yeah, yeah, take a chill pill. Five extra seconds won't kill ya. I get in my truck and follow him out there, and when we get there, I grab my tools and head to the car. Surprisingly, there's nothing there or in there except for the keys on the seat. No kids or dogs, so now I'm just hoping it's actually their car. You better not mess up my doors, dude. It's a classic. Yeah, a classic Ford piece of crap. I open it up in about 10 seconds and check the insurance card, and it's theirs. I pick up the keys and go over to him and tell him it's $40, and he looks at me dumbfounded. You mean I have to pay for this? Uh, yeah. Sir, we charge a service fee when a call is taken and we have to go out to location. Well, I'm not paying you for that. You did it in 10 seconds. I could have done it myself if I had known. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't just do this for free. I could have, but there was no real urgency, like a life endangered, and he was rude about the whole thing. We normally would just bill someone in the situation, but we've been burned too many times. We only do that for companies. I'm not paying for that. I don't have any money. Well, then if you think you can do it yourself, go for it. I threw his keys in the car, locked the door, shut it behind me, and left. I got home about 10 minutes later, and then after an hour, he calls back. I can't get it open. Come back and open my car again. Well, I can come out again, but I'll have to charge you for two service calls. F you, dude. I'm not paying you 80 bucks. Well, then I guess you can call another locksmith. I'm sure he'll be happy to help. Click. I didn't tell him, but the other locksmith charges $100 to unlock cars, and I never heard back from him. I love how this dude is like, are you kidding me? I'm not paying you. If I knew how to do that, you could have done it myself. Well, like, yeah, that goes for basically anything, dude. You pay a surgeon to do surgery because you don't know how to do it yourself. The guy went to school to learn how to unlock cars. You know, anyone could do anything if they knew how to do it. That might be the dumbest reason I've ever heard not to pay in my life. You know, Mr. Mechanic, I also could have rebuilt an engine if I knew how to do it. So this should be free. They were going to charge them 400 pounds? I work in retail in a UK electronics retailer, and this takes place yesterday and today. So a customer comes up to me looking for a new laptop. I'm showing him around a few of the laptops, and he states he needs something portable but powerful, and of course these two things usually mean a 13-inch laptop with an i5 or i7. Well, what do you need it for? The laptop has to be powerful, but I need it to be lightweight because I'm an international student. Right, alright, well here's some laptops that fit this description. Well the thing about these laptops is they're usually around 600 pounds to 1000 pounds depending on the brand and specifications. Now I notice the customer is carrying a laptop in a carrier bag so I ask him about it. Just being a bit nosy but also making conversation as I show him around the laptops. So what's wrong with that laptop? Oh, the battery blew up and it doesn't turn on anymore. Okay, well, can I take a look? He takes it out of the bag and I notice it's a MacBook Air and being at the store's Apple person, I ask if I can look at it. Now, I notice it has another computer shop sticker on the top of it, so I ask about it, and he said I took it there, part of an Apple-style chain with a shop literally down the road people mistake for an Apple store. What did they say is wrong with it? They didn't open it up, but they said it'd be 400 pounds for the problem I told them I thought it was. They quoted it and haven't even 
and taken a look at it, no surprises there. So I took the Mac from the customer and walked him down to the Apple counter of our small store. I plug it into the Mac charger and notice it's lighting up green, but not switching to amber, which it would do. So just out of habit, I performed a little reset, which basically is a hard reset to tell the Mac to get it together, and it turned on. Oh wow, you got it working. Yeah, I just want to check and make sure it isn't a fluke. I got the customer to change the language from his native to English and got to diagnostics, and the test came back fine and the battery reported fine. It's in good working order with no problems, it just needed this reset and now it's fine. However, your charger's toast, so you need one of those. That's awesome, thank you so much. My dissertation was on there and I would have to start it again. Now I just completed my dissertation, so I completely understand the situation and, and stress of university life. Well, how much is that going to be to fix it? Nothing, man. It was two minutes and fast, so don't worry about it. To this, the customer becomes all thankful and happy and tells me he wants to pay for dinner, and I insist it's okay and part of my job. So he's on his way with his Mac in working order and warning not to use the charger in an extra form of storage to keep his backup just in case he loses it again and doesn't lose his work. Today, he came back in to purchase the new charger and was looking specifically for me in the store. He had gone out and bought me a cake and macarons from a high-end cake shop. At first, I said I couldn't accept it and was thinking of work and the cake obviously costing a lot of money, but after much insistence, I did accept and the customer was happy, and I left work later in the evening with a cake in town, with a cake in tow and a smile on my face. Not all customers are difficult, and it left me with a lot of joy at the end of the work day. You know, I had to switch it up and throw a good one in there. Honestly, this one's just great because it goes to show that A, sometimes businesses are just trying to rip you off. You should always get a second opinion. And B, not all retail jobs end with you getting slapped in the face by a Karen with a ham sandwich. You know, every now and then you get some sweet up uh, baked goods out of it. Could you imagine if this became standard, bro? Like, you know, I feel like people would have a lot more patience with someone being difficult if when they went above and beyond for a customer, people were bringing them cake instead of just like not anything. But what kind of car is it? was just reminded of a very old conversation I had with a customer and how strange it was. This was some years ago, so the details are sketchy, although the themes and results are pretty much the same. I used to have a job working selling TVs at a big electronics chain store, and I once had this weird customer walk in and ask me if I thought a TV would fit in his car. I don't remember the TV, but let's say it's like a 50-inch plasma. I'm that old. Obviously, you know, I would need to know what kind of interior space he would have, so I started to ask him details about his car. All right, well, what kind of car do you have? Uh, it's a Mercedes. All right, well, what type? Uh, Mercedes. At this point, he took on a tone as though I wasn't listening. Yeah, those are great cars, but what model do you have? I don't know, but it shouldn't matter. Well, I would need to know what kind of car it is so I can figure out if it'll fit. I already told you it's a Mercedes. I still don't know what kind of car he had, nor do I have any idea if the TV would fit, but I suggest that he take delivery instead to avoid ruining the nice interior of his car, and it worked. I love that, dude. Imagine someone being like, hey, will this fit in my car? What type of car is it? Ford. All right, is that an F-150? You know, like, what are we working with here? A Ford Focus? An Escalade? Like, come on. Or Escape. An Escalade is a Cadillac. I'm sorry. I'm out here trying, all right? I'm sorry, I don't know all the model numbers of, like, the Pokemon evolution of the Ford version of cars, okay? I'm out here trying my best. And you probably should know what car you have. It doesn't matter if you don't know what everything on the road is, but at the very least, you should probably know what you're driving. Oh, my car declined? Well, then take this crap back. So back in college, I lost my job due to my school schedule conflicting with the hours of my boss that they were demanding that I work. It was the holiday season, so I decided my best bet would be finding another retailer that was looking for seasonal staff and looking for another job in the meantime. I ended up finding a very popular bath and body store in the mall that's hiring. First week, everything is fine and I'm getting the hang of it. I know the products well, the discount is great, and I hadn't had any real wild Karen incidents until Black Friday. Black Friday, I got scheduled a 12-hour register shift. Not the worst thing I could be doing for 12 hours, because most people were being pleasant and excited to get shopping underway. Here came Karen. The location I worked at was just over the border into the States from Canada. She immediately came up to the register with easily $400 in merchandise and slammed it down in front of me. I tried to remain pleasant and asked if she found everything okay and if she needed anything wrapped, and this was the conversation. Alright, so uh, we're looking to wrap all this up today, are we? Well, that's your job 
isn't it? Am I supposed to wrap it myself? No, ma'am, but you know, sometimes people put these into other gifts so they don't always want them wrapped together. Are all the same scents going together and being wrapped, or is there another way you want them separated? Are you stupid? Just wrap them. Yes, ma'am, I'll get on that just as soon as we complete the transaction. Your total today is X amount of dollars. Will you be paying cash or card? Card, did you put my discount in for coming from Canada? I'm sorry, we don't offer a discount for Canadian shoppers. I apologize. You're lying. I always get a discount for being from Canada. All right, well, let me call over my manager and confirm that I didn't make a mistake. Give me a moment. I hopped on my headset and called the manager, and he tells me that that's never been a thing. I'm sorry, but I spoke to the manager, and we have not, nor ever, nor are we offering a discount for Canadian shoppers. I do apologize for the confusion there. Ugh, fine, just run my card and do something useful. All right, ma'am, just go ahead and slide your card for me, and then we'll get this all wrapped up. The card declined. I'm sorry, ma'am, you'll have to get another form of payment. It says this was declined. What did you say? How do you expect me to hear you over these people? Speak up. Your card declined. Do you have another form of payment? You really needed to announce that to the entire line? F you, you can take all this back. She then proceeded to pick up a lotion bottle, one of the glass spa ones, and whip it at my head. That one got her escorted out of the mall and banned by security, but I, on the other hand, was fine, but took off my apron and walked out because the money was not worth it. Speak up! I need you to speak up! I didn't like that you speak up! Here, take a glass lotion bottle to the face! No thank you, alright? No retail job is worth getting smacked in the face with a glass bottle. I don't care what it is that I'm selling or how much the commission could potentially be. Alright, I take that back. If you're offering me a billion dollar commission to sell, like, I don't know, rocket ships to, like, billionaires, and, I, I, you know, even if I convince them to buy a bunch of stupid stuff, I know that nothing bad happens to them, really. I'll do it. You know, I'd feel bad selling Selling some dude a car he doesn't need. Selling a billionaire a rocket he doesn't need. Who's really harmed in that? You know, not my bank account, that's for sure. Just open up another register. So I work in a smallish size store, and on a typical day, we only have two employees, usually management and cashier, working at any given time. This means one employee on the register while the other walks the sales floor and stocks. On a normal day, this is more than enough, but occasionally we get a rush of people in the store and we open a second register. If the second employee isn't in the middle of helping a customer on the floor, they always jump onto the register as soon as they're available. Now, our customers are usually understanding and patient when these rushes happen. However, in the last week, I had two occasions where full-grown adults threw the biggest fits because there wasn't a second register currently available. The first one happened during our shift change. These are the worst since things are chaotic already. And to make things worse, it was the end of a new employee's first shift. I had just clocked out and was gathering my things, double-checking the schedule for my next shift and who I would be working with. The manager that just came in 20 minutes prior, switched the other two employees out, and during this time, there was only one person in line and maybe five groups of people in the store in total. So it was the ideal time to switch them. She took the new person to the office to count their till and help them with clocking out. While I was heading out, the phone went off. The on-duty manager was still busy, so I went ahead and answered it, and it happened to have been another store asking questions, so I sat down and answered a few of them. During this time, everyone in the store decided they were going to leave at once. I had just finished talking to the other store and walked out. Instantly, I was approached by a man asking for what sounded like I was looking for a job. This wasn't uncommon, so I pointed to the poster next to the register that gave the website to apply and explained we were looking for new employees, and the conversation went like this. Hey, I've only got a couple things. Do you mind opening up another line? Sorry, I'm actually off the clock and leaving. However, they're almost done in the office and we'll be able to open it up in a minute. Why can't you just open up a second line? I don't have a draw and I'm off the clock. Why isn't there another damn checker? Sorry, they are in the middle of a shift change and having some technical issues. New person was having a hard time figuring things out. They are almost done and we'll be out in a minute. If you weren't in that office yapping your mouths off, y'all would be done. This is crappy customer service. That really pissed me off because the yapping, he was hearing me talking to another store about related questions and the manager guiding the new girl through the end of shifts. By no means were we yapping. And then, as to make me even more irritated, some middle-aged teen jumped in. Why do you have shift changes in the middle of the day anyways? It'd be smart if you don't change shifts. I was done. 
I don't make the schedule, I just follow it. Someone's gonna be out in a minute. You can either wait here or you can wait in line. Sorry, but I'm off the clock. I walked into the office to let him know the tension on the floor and walked out. The man must have also walked out because his handful of items was on the counter. The funny thing is, the woman that was originally behind him was was up at the open register checking out. If he would have waited three minutes, he could have left with what he wanted. Nothing was worse than like the walk of terror out of the store or the place I was working in uniform and just hoping nobody asked me a question because the amount of times people will be like, hey, do you know? Nope, I'm off the clock. They even tried to make it a rule where I was working for a bit that you had to answer questions if you were like on break or going somewhere. And uh, I'll have you know that nobody was really too fond of that. Because listen, if I'm clocked out, I'm officially no longer getting paid. I'm not answering questions for stuff that I'm supposed to be getting paid for if I'm not getting paid. What do you think this is? Charity? No. Business is about paying the workers, too. You sell stuff, you get paid. You give me a portion of the profits. Policy is policy. I work as a cashier at a construction store, so when people make returns and have no record of making a purchase, they have to present a form of ID so we can issue it a gift card. Their ID needs to be shown or scanned if they want to use the gift card, and if it's the wrong ID, even if it's a spouse, we can't accept it. I had a guy come into my line who was making a rather large purchase, mostly wood, nails, etc., just your basic building materials for whatever construction project he happened to be working on. When the guy got ready to pay, he handed me a gift card and I took it as usual. Hun, I need to see your ID. I just need to see the name. He handed me his ID. I check it over and realize that the names don't match. Sir, not that I'm an expert, but I don't think this is you. Oh, yeah, that's my boss. Is he here with you? No. Well, then I can't accept this. You're gonna have to pay with something else. He made a return and wanted to use the money to purchase these. I'm trying to think of the best way to be diplomatic about this. Well, I get what he's doing. He wants to keep all the purchases on one card, right? So he doesn't want to give you cash? Yeah. That's smart. I like that idea. I have people that do that. But if he's not here with you, I can't take the card. I smiled brightly and handed it back to him. Well, I can call him and he can tell you. I mean, even if he does call and I speak to him, it doesn't change the fact that I can't take the card. Well, whatever, I'll pay with something else. At this point, I figured it's the end of the issue. He asks a few questions about the stuff he's purchased and asks me to recheck prices on things, and he finally pulls out another card. Why can't I use the card? He's my boss. I get that, but I can't run it. It's policy. What do you think? I stole it? I gave him a puzzled look. He gave it to me. How could you have stolen it if he gave it to you? I didn't steal it. I didn't say that you stole it. You, and I pointed at him, brought it up, not me. Like I said, I get it. Your boss is trying to make it easier so you can do your job and he can do his, but I can't break policy for you. Next time, just have him come in so I can explain it to him if you want. The guy stumbled over his words for a little bit and then quickly paid and left, and I moved on to the next customer. He ended up coming back in 15 minutes later. You know it was wrong of you to do that. I just gazed at him, waiting for him to move so I can get to the next customer. I really want to speak to your manager. You're more than welcome to, but that's not going to change the policy. He started getting angrier and raising his voice. Why not? What's it even for? At this point, I was still trying to be diplomatic. It's to protect hardworking people like you and your boss from someone trying to use their money. It's a pain in the butt, but it works. This is true. It's to prevent theft, but at that point, I'm just trying to get him to leave. Where's your manager? I motioned to the large sign posted across the store. At the customer service desk. You can talk to him if you want. You should have let me use it. I told you, it's policy. But I have the card. At that point, I just had it with them. I had two customers waiting for me to finish up the fiasco, so I decided to put my proverbial foot down and make it very clear that this conversation was over. I'm not breaking policy for you, nor risking my job. I have to get back to work. I motioned to the very kind people waiting on me. If you're gonna make a complaint, then please go do so. He started angrily muttering. With that said, I deliberately turned my back to him and started ringing the next person in line. The guy hung around for five minutes trying to get my attention, waving his arms and making making hand motions to get me to look at him. I refused to acknowledge his presence at that point because the conversation on my end was over and he wanted to file a complaint with the manager. I figured he'd go do it. Eventually, he left after swearing up a storm when he realized he was getting no further explanations and I never did hear of any complaints. It's the worst when you're just like following rules that you just have to follow for your job and people start getting mad at you for it. Like, I promise you that the worker didn't make the policy that they're not allowed to use this card without ID. I guarantee you that's not the rule that they invented 
invented. They're just trying to do their job, bro. If they were in charge of corporate policy, I guarantee you they wouldn't be at the cash register. You know, people in charge of corporate policy that do stuff like that tend to kind of be in an office somewhere else. That's just kind of how it's been. Nothing against cashiers, bro. I'm just saying it tends to be people who making policies are never in the store where they're actually being used because otherwise policies would make any amount of sense. And usually corporate policies are stupid. $198.81 candy bar. I work as a manager for a small chain of these convenience stores, 30-ish locations. I was putting away my main order of the week when a woman comes in asking for an outrageous bar. I told her with a smile we had some right in front of the store and as I pointed her to a blank spot on the shelf. Turns out we had sold out over the weekend, and I had just broken this poor woman's heart and shattered her dreams with false hope. She had been searching relentlessly for weeks and couldn't find one anywhere. I apologized for the bad fortune and said I would order more straight away, and the woman sighed, bowed her head, and walked out of the store like a dejected puppy. I turned back to order, opened the tub, and right on top was a brand new box of Nutrageous Bars. I tore open the box and vaulted open the counter like a cop sliding over a car hood and sprinted out the door like I had just clocked out. I caught up with her just as she was starting to pull away from my store, and as she was pulling out, she turned and saw me lumbering towards her, holding the candy bar like a newborn child I had just delivered into the world. I have never seen someone so happy over candy. She runs to me like she's a veteran running home from duty and running towards their children for their first swirling embrace. I tell her she can have it on the house and have a good day. And then, just now, I got a call from my district manager demanding to know if I was the one who gave away to the uh, candy bar to the customer for free. Crap, I think to myself. I do something nice for someone and she called my boss to tell on me? So I tell my boss that it was me and he tells me that she called and was so happy with our company she would be choosing us for the local volunteer firefighter appreciation gifts this year. $2,000 in gift cards, $25 each for the volunteers. My boss said he was giving me a 10% commission minus the price of a nutrageous bar. I don't know what a nutrageous bar is, man, but congratulations on the $200. See, sometimes it does pay to go a little bit above and beyond if someone's not being a Karen, I'm telling you, we gotta make it a thing. Stupid Boss Cripples Navy Ship's Connectivity A little more than a decade ago, when I was still active duty U.S. Navy, we were on a deployment and at that point sailing in the Mediterranean Sea. One of my technicians was working on the main interference between ships' internal networks and a satellite. Everything went through this system. Internet, email, messaging, ship-to-shore phones, secure networks, all of it. We'd been having a connection issue with the shore and my boss tells me and my tech to enter a change into the configuration. We do and nothing really happened, so my boss told my tech to enter something different. This goes on for 30 minutes back and forth until I hear this. Change that to this, then restart. I have to copy the running config over. It should take a minute or two. I know how the system works. I'm the one who went to school for it. Just restart it. He went to the school for two versions ago. It's a completely different system, and it didn't work the same. One of the commands he had the tech enter cleared the startup config that they had just written for the last 30 minutes. If we restart, we're going to lose everything in the system, and a reload's going to take way longer. Just do what I tell you to do. The bigger boss needs to get messages out of our next port visit. I had talked to the bigger boss earlier in the day and he was glad not to have tons of emails coming in and couldn't care less. Just let me test this copy and I'll restart it. Just get out of my way and I'll do it. He walked over to me and said we better open the safe and get the backup ready. We entered our combos into the safe and pulled it, and I looked at the sleeve and the date of the last backup was after we left home port. No big deal. What the heck? I, I can't get into anything now. We walk over, disk in hand, and get ready to reload everything. Pop the disk in, pull the file just to visually verify everything, and the file has only the header, nothing else. I asked the boss, who according to the log did the last backup. It's an easy process, and he usually always took the easy ones because he's the boss if he verified the file before he burnt the disk. What do you think, I'm an idiot? Of course I did everything. Well, there's nothing there now. Tech pulled the other older disk, and we're gonna try to rebuild it from there. Uh, there's not an older one. There has to be. We keep two just for this reason. It's not there, man. Go ahead and take a look. I go through every disk in the binder, and he's right. It's gone. I shredded it. We only need the most current. You what? Oh my gosh, hand me the satellite phone, I'll be back. Because the boss wanted to save the ginormous amount of space that a single CD takes up, we were completely disconnected with an empty box of a router. It took me two hours of drop sat calls to a few civilian technicians to get a new config made and sent out via regular mail. Two weeks later, we got the disk in hand and had the system restored in an hour, and the boss was ordered to not touch the system again while stationed on board.
Oh man, dude, I don't even know why you would shove the technician out of the way and do it yourself if you have no clue what you're doing. Especially after you shredded the only other backup you have on board. I love how he's like, mm, yeah, this single CD, no, no, taking up way too much space. I gotta throw it overboard. What's going on, guys? It's your boy Scrub here, back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am. And today I'm gonna be going over the subreddit r slash tales from tech support. It's a pretty fun one, you know. I just love watching boomers be confused with technology. Technology, no offense to the boomers. So uh, yeah, I figured it would make a good video. So without further ado, let's get into it. Are you sure that you want to fire me? A couple years ago, I worked in a big energy infrastructure company. I worked there for over four years, starting out as a technician, but because I'm a very IT-oriented person, I soon find myself doing maintenance and new server room builds. Because of the nature of this industry in my country, I happen to be one of the very few on-site IT support guys in the whole nation. Later, I found myself to be the only one since all the others moved to different positions, and I also regularly did energy production maintenance because of the some reason the company felt like they didn't need a full-time on-site IT support. About three and a half years to my employment, I was diagnosed with an illness that affected my production maintenance part greatly. In fact, I couldn't do it at all. I won't go into details, but uh, basically all I could and was still doing on-site IT support and installations since I was the most qualified, and I was also the only one who was doing it at the moment. Our main IT crew was located in another country, but I made friends with most of them in the years of my on-site support. At some point, when equipment was already aged many years, we started having problems with it. I began having jobs hundreds of kilometers away in different maintenance areas as well because all the other support guys had left. I had a colleague in maintenance that I started to take along for some of the jobs because I really needed some help. Some of the tasks took several days, sometimes even a week of traveling to do it all. He wasn't qualified for IT, but I thought he'd learn as I teach him, and it turned out he actually learned some but was sloppy and got distracted. One time he even got himself electrocuted with the main rails of doing maintenance, but that's a different story. It turned out the company was not happy because of the illness I had and wanted me out. I could still do the IT stuff fine, but since that was not the position they hired me for, they started to give me a hard time. I contacted some of my colleagues abroad and they said they really needed me for IT support and installations, and after some time, the big bosses decided they didn't need me anymore since I was not able to do the work they hired me for. Let me remind you, I was literally the only IT support guy in the whole country qualified to do my job. Some months go by and I'm eventually fired. I tried to fight the termination with the union lawyer with my boss and other colleagues, but there was no luck. I had six months left and then I was out. I had no problem doing the support because my illness didn't affect it though. Almost immediately after I was no longer working, I started getting phone calls from the colleague I had tried to train for the same job I was doing. He had his hands full with all the stuff I used to do before, but I could clearly tell he had not listened to half of what I told him. He was calling me to ask the most basic questions of how to do maintenance and troubleshooting, and I was dumbfounded that they actually moved this guy to IT support since he had no idea how to do it. And I also recall telling my boss that this guy is not fit for the job. After a while, I heard the local boss, who was nice, was in trouble because he had no qualified IT support for server maintenance, and the guys abroad were asking what happened to me because they needed stuff done. To this date, they still haven't gotten anyone qualified to do the job, and guys abroad have to travel hundreds or thousands of kilometers to do maintenance and installations that I previously completed in hours. I can't see how the company saved money for it. It's crazy how detached most management is from actual work and tasks. Bro, I can't believe that they thought it would literally be cheaper to to fly people thousands of miles to install it over a period of days than to just make their full-time IT guy strictly a full-time IT guy. Like, if you're not able to do the other aspects of the job, but you're the only person in the country who can do it, you think they'd be a little smarter before they fired you or just not fire you. Spare parts? I had a gig supporting a company's mainframes when PCs first started to become popular. The IT director, Bob, whose technical expertise didn't extend much past punch cards and paper tape, decided that no one in his empire should ever have a PC better than his. We got a shipment of new PCs, and of course the first one went onto a table in Bob's office. We were pretty sure he never used it, because every time he went into his office, it's buried under an ever-growing pile of manuals, magazines, memos, and coffee cups. A month went by, and someone needed a replacement keyboard, so after Bob left, we snuck into his office, moved the crap off the PC, and took the keyboard. Then another guy's monitor got wonky, so we took Bob's. And within a few months, we took the memory, hard drive, power supply, coaxial cable, power cable, and all he had left was an empty case. And when the company had a next round of upgrades, Bob was first in line because he's a power user. 
I just love the idea of this IT director literally never using his computer. Like, you took every part out of it, and yet here he is claiming he's the expert on all things computer. Honestly, it's it's a little bit hysterical that he gave himself a new one, too, not even realizing you guys stole everything. I'm a little bit of a power user myself. Automating your paperwork. Got an old one from back when I worked in a repair depot for a major electronics box store. So when I worked there in college, we did a ton of repairs. Every repair had paperwork. We had to do through an app, entering in serial numbers, product IDs, parts used, etc. This was all fine and good, except we had literally dozens of pallets and massive bins of this certain crappy tablet. These tablets were cheap, and the company's flagship tablet was so revolutionary because it ran Windows. Well, these tablets only had three or four product numbers, usually depending on the size, and they only had one replaceable part. It was a motherboard that was all-in-one and cheap as the rest of the tablet. And that was the only thing you would replace. If the screen was damaged, you failed it and moved on. Battery damaged, you might salvage some screens, but you wouldn't document it since it wasn't a new part. Anyways, these things you could mass repair or fail out. I could fully break down and rebuild one in six minutes at one point. But the paperwork, even with barcodes taped to my desk and a scanner, would slow me down. Naturally, we had quotas, but between testing, getting parts, doing the swap, testing again, and then doing the paperwork, you'd get bogged down and usually miss a few that won't count on day's quota because you missed your paperwork. Paperwork mainly slowed you down due to all the screens you had to go to for each step, just an endless navigation even to fail a union. So I decided I was in college learning to code, and I wrote a script to read a spreadsheet where I quickly scanned in the basics, pass-fail, product ID, part numbers. I'd do blocks of like 10 tablets, as many as I could fit on my desk and shelves, and scan them in while testing and such. Then at the end of the day, I'd run the script, it would read the boxes, fill in the stuff accordingly, and then close the ticket off, printing pass-or-fail labels for shipping. I'd match them up to the boxes and ship them out. Management didn't like it because it wasn't company-approved. Mid submitted it to the company, but never heard anything anything back, so I kept using it regardless because I was turning out the most repairs. Towards the end, I even spread it out to a few people I liked and trusted and taught them how to use it and made sure my work wasn't just gone at the end and could continue saving others from boring paperwork. Truly the hero we need, dude. I just don't really understand why management wouldn't want a system to automate all their paperwork. You made it for them and everything, and they're like, nah, we're not really interested, okay? We're paying you by the hour. That includes your paperwork. You'd be getting a lot more done, and they're like, shut up, Gerald. Are you the manager, or am I? Okay, who's got the name tag? Self-starters. I used to work for a hardware support department at an international investment bank. Most white space work is an ongoing refresh project to update most end users' workstations on a rolling three-year cycle. If the department doesn't want to spend money, however, sometimes they opt for just ordering RAM from us or holding off in the hope that they can get an extra cycle. Come one department. We were swapping the boxes for some team that had been in limbo for a while, and when I came out of the little waif of an analyst, she stopped me after I said I was taking the box. Usually it's some sort of, I'm still working, you can wait. We did it during the day for back office folk because then we can watch them and load their accounts and test their apps in front of us. The process takes 10 minutes, but nah. She logged out and shut down, then crawled under her own desk, unplugged the PC, opened it up, and took the RAM out. This is mine. Where's our RAM? She opened up a desk drawer, and indeed, there were two sticks of ancient, unshielded RAM that we used were there. I didn't know. I should probably report you for messing with your computer, but I'm not even mad. Color me impressed. You knew which kind to buy, too. This was easier than getting my boss to approve upgrades. Well, here's our number. New box uses the same type of RAM, and call us if you end up bitlockering it. You'll end up getting better results than running it through the hell ass ticketing process. The best end users are the ones you never see. Bro, are you kidding me? Trying to get any, like, work computer upgraded is the most painful process ever. Anyone with a gaming PC has uh, at least thought about this at least once, you know? One of my managers, when I worked at the grocery store, actually brought in one of his graphics cards, like a really old one, and put it in his work computer. This would be the best person to have if you worked in IT, though. Do what I mean, not what I say. I worked in IT support for a major bank somewhere somewhere in the UK. This tale is from long before COVID and working from home. We'd always taken disaster recovery seriously, as long as we had a week's notice of impending disaster, but that's another tragedy. After 9-11, we started planning for business continuity to what would happen if your workplace is compromised. So we acquired a building on the opposite side of the country, kitted it out, wired it up, and we're all set. The first test was a bit ropey, but we improved with practice and made sure to rotate staff and keep everything written down at the recovery site. Skip forward a couple years and I got the alert. It's that time and I have to join the other designated survivors across the country. 
We all wake, may, make our way across the number called, gain entry to the building and find our desks, power up our desktops, boot to connect, and nothing. That's odd. None of us can connect to the network. One of the network guys has a laptop and dials in, checks that all the network switches have switched, and it's all good. We just can't see it. He starts following the network cable from his PC along the floor to the two foot by two foot floor tile where all the cables are concentrated before going underneath the switch and lifts the tile. On the other side, I saw two inches of each cable protruding into an empty space. It was as if, if someone had taken a pair of shears and just chopped through the lot of them, which is exactly what happened. Some months previously, it had been decreed that that floor tile must be moved. I think it was to allow for more desks or something. The guy moving it saw the wires when he lifted it and asked about them, and they said, just remove them, meaning unplug each cable from the socket on the other side of the tile so they could be replugged later. But the woman's psychic interference was on the fritz, and she only heard the words that that came from the boss's mouth, snip snip. So yeah, we didn't pass the business continuity test that day. Continuity test, sorry. I mean, to be fair, the boss did say remove the wire, you know. Uh, they didn't say permanently or not, that's the only difference. How did they just get a buzzsaw and cut through all of that, dude? You also know the company couldn't have been happy that they bought this entire building just for somebody to ruin the entire reason it existed in the first place? The Ghost in the Machine. So a few years ago, I worked at a point of sale company that provided systems to casinos for their various restaurants and snack areas. One such customer called us in a panic that one of their machines was randomly opening cash drawers in one of their snack areas and they're about to get in trouble with the gaming commission. For those that don't know, all casinos are governed by the Casino Gaming Commission that regulates how money, machines, and other various aspects of businesses are run to keep it above board. So I go off about an hour and a half drive out to take a look. As anyone who's gone to work at casino security is so much fun. I checked my ID with them and I was allowed a guest pass and then had to wait about 10 minutes for a security guard to come escort me. First, they take me to the security camera room and show me the recordings of the drawer opening on both its own and with people around and without. Once I am fully confused, then I am shown to the area in question, which is another thing that they have to be with you the whole time, no matter how long it takes you. As a side note for anyone who has gotten this far, I've already ruled out any viruses or hacks purely because the system is ran on CE and they would have needed to get past the main firewall and a few other hurdles to get in. So I show up and go to work on the machines. I start testing things and drawers pop up just fine. There were other two drawers on the machine. All the connections look fine and I start taking apart the drawer to see if maybe there's a short in there. Of course, as soon as I pull it out, there's one dollar bill shoved at the back so I have to stop what I'm doing and wait for a second security guard to come and put on a show for the camera to make sure the whopping three dollars is safe. Once that 15 minutes was over, I went back to checking everything out. I just love the idea of these like two ginormous six foot seven casino security guards and they're like, well, what's going on in there? Are you being weird with the money? He's like, no, the register keeps opening because you guys are shoving so much money in it that it can't close. What a problem to have, you know? That's why gambling doesn't pay, kids. Remember, casinos are literally rolling in your money. Whoops! Way back in the old days when I was a developer, I wrote a system to generate statistics and reports from a live data stream. When I was developing it, I had no access to the actual data stream, just speculation for the format it was in. So to test my software, I wrote a small program to replicate the data with random data just to do what I could to check it was calculating correctly. The program was put into use and the whole department loved it. Fast forward a year and I got a request to do some changes. I called up the original program listing, and to my horror, I discovered that I forgot to switch off the random data generator. This means they had been receiving bogus stats for almost a year and nobody even noticed. So I made the changes, switched off the numbers, and recompiled everything and said nothing. I mean, if none of the workers noticed or said anything, I don't really think that's entirely on you, right? Like they were just getting bullcrap data for a year and didn't notice, I feel like somebody in that office needs to be paying a little bit more attention. I mean, sure, you shouldn't have wrote it wrong, but it's kind of on them for not noticing it for months and months and months. Try printing it upside down. Late on one particular night, I received a call from a longtime customer, long enough to predate the opening of my business. I'd recently helped him with an OS update on his PC. And he's mostly been fine getting things set up, he preferred to do it himself without additional help from me. As our story starts though, he calls me up because he needs help printing something, but the printer isn't working. As I, and I'm sure many other IT techs can attest, printers are one of the banes of our existence. Printers are a box-shaped demon with ink toner for blood that can always find a way to frustrate even the most experienced tech wizard, and fortunately, my client issues tonight turned out to be a straightforward issue that was resolved quickly. Unfortunately, though, that's also part one. 
The client wants me to demonstrate the printer is working by helping him print out three particular pages of a document, in this specific case, pages 3, 4, and 17. No big deal, I remoted to his PC, loaded it up, and tell him to pick and print three cherry-picked pages. Over the call, I can hear his printer spit to life and the sounds of printers moving over and over. All good, I think. Only there's a catch. According to the client, 4 and 17 didn't print anything. I asked the client if he means the printer stopped printing after page 3, but apparently that wasn't the case. The printer had page, or printed page 3 se seamlessly, but then just printed two blank pieces of paper. My first thought was that the printer had probably run out of ink, but, you know, sadly this was not the case. Page 3 had been printed perfectly the first time and subsequent times, and printing a color test page worked perfectly too. But given pages 4 and 17 of this cursed document, it really was printing nothing. Over the course of the call, we tried just about everything. Changing the ink density, scaling settings, turning both the PC and printer on and off again, even exporting the pages to separate PDF files or JPEG or PNG images. The results were the same every time. The printer would fire up, you could hear the printer heads moving, but it simply wouldn't put ink to paper. It would spit out a blank page, and something about the content of this print job was making the printer refuse to put ink to the paper, and it it seemed like there was no solution. After about an hour of grasping at straws, we were both ready to give up when the client made a suggestion. Try printing it upside down. I exported the pages to images, rotated it 180 degrees, and sent it to the evil magic printer box, and it printed perfectly. Genuinely, man, I don't even understand how the printer even started thinking like that. No, I'm not going to print anything until you flip it upside down, and then I'm just going to work. This really is how it feels sometimes to be trying to fix a computer issue, dude. You're just banging your head on the wall. You're 17 Google pages deep into trying to fix this issue, and nothing's working. After you bang your head on the wall, though, I guess it shakes the desk somehow, and the PC starts to work. I just feel like IT is one of those things where yeah 90% of the time it's a quick fix but that like 10% of the time where it's going to take you all day is probably some of the most frustrating things ever just trying to get a printer to print the stupid piece of paper. I was just in the drive through and the vehicle in front of me was not paying attention and was not moving forward when it was time to so I gave him a polite little honk. He did not like this, and once he rolled to the window, he proceeded to take as long as he possibly could there. I don't know what he told the baristas, but when I got to the window, he had paid for my drink, and every single person that was working there stood at the window and gave me the stink eye. And when I explained that the man was rude and we didn't do it to be nice, they continued to roll their eyes at me and continued to give me a stink eye. I don't know what kind of etiquette training is being done, but it made me feel terrible. There was no reason to make me feel terrible other than you also feel terrible and thought it was appropriate to make others feel as bad as you. This is disgraceful and I'm embarrassed that that happened. I'm embarrassed. Who changes their staff around to get stink eyes to customers who does that? I cannot believe I was treated with such disrespect and I did not at all do anything to deserve it and I cannot believe what happened. I will never be returning there and I almost don't want to ever go to anywhere near it again because of this kind of attitude. Attitude. Every last barista had. Every last one of you. It's disgusting and it's embarrassing you think this stuff is okay. That seems like an insanely angry way of saying I honked at somebody that paid for my drink and then looked really stupid in the process. I bet you the reason they were giving you a weird look is because the guy was taking forever because it was probably pretty complicated for him to pay for everybody in line's drink. And the first thing you did when you pulled up was talk about how rude he was. Oh yeah, the guy who just spent a couple hundred dollars buying everybody coffee? He really, really sucks. What's going on guys, it's your boy Scrub here, back again with another video, hope you guys are having a great day, I know I am. And I think everybody hates having to deal with Karens, you know, entitled people, anyone that thinks they're better than everybody for no reason. So I figured I would go to the subreddit Entitled Parents, gather some of the best posts that have been on there, and uh, share them with you guys, we could talk about them. If you enjoy dunking on Karens, be sure to press the like button, and without further ado, let's go. A few years ago, I used to work at a local store in the area as a security officer. Basically, I would stand at the door like a visual deterrent for people who tried to steal since my company is not hands-on. Most of the time, my job was pretty boring. I stood there at the door, nodding and smiling to people, and we didn't have many cases of people actually trying to steal. One day, though, we got a delightful woman who came to the store. I was standing outside when I get a call over my radio to come to one of the registers. I started to walk in, and I can already hear this woman yelling vulgar things 
things at a cashier. The manager sees me walking up and comes to talk to me. Yeah, this woman's gonna be kicked off property, so I need you to stand with her till she decides to leave. Okay, sounds good to me. I walk over and the lady and the manager and they start to talk. Ma'am, we're gonna ask you to leave now as we will not be helping you any longer. You can't deny service to me. I am the customer. I'm always right. No, ma'am, we actually do have the right to refuse service to anyone. There's even a sign on the door. I refuse to move till you ring up my items. The manager just shrugged at me and started moving the cashier to another register and closed the line Karen was standing in, and the Karen kept screaming vulgar things at the poor cashier. The Karen looks around the store for someone to agree with her, and thankfully no one's on her side and most people are avoiding eye contact with her. She looks back at me and starts trying to get me to agree with her, and I remain silent and she starts banging on the counter. Is no one really going to help me? No ma'am, they've asked you to leave. No they can't do that, this is a public building. Actually, this is a private building, and they have every legal right to refuse service to anyone for any reason. They don't even legally have to tell you why they are kicking you out. I also have to inform you that you will be blacklisted from all their properties they own, so you will no longer be able to shop here anymore. I will sue you! Ma'am, although I might be working here, I personally do not work for the business. I work for XYZ Business, and I have no say over any policy, so suing me is going to get you nowhere? I want your manager's name and number. Of course, ma'am, and I gave her all the information she asked for, plus my ID number and name. Karen takes my information and says, I'm gonna get you fired for refusing service to me. Okay, ma'am. After about 30 minutes of standing there listening to her yelling for the manager to come back, alright, we called the cops and they're gonna be here shortly to remove you. You will all regret this. I love Karens like this because, you know, she's proudly standing here screaming about how she's gonna sue everyone. I'm just saying lawsuits are expensive, and I feel like people that actually have the money to be tossing around lawsuits all willy-nilly also don't have the free time to be standing there for an hour after they've been kicked out just screaming at nobody. Like, literally, they close the line and walk the other way, and she still stayed in the store for an hour? My goodness, dude, you've gotta be a loser to have the ability to just stay that mad for an hour hour over like a, a pair of jeans I mean come on you think at some point they would just get tired of it you know their voice would give out that means they'd have to be doing screaming at managers quite often to get this endurance up I love when she looks around for other people to help them out dude that's a Karen classic as well and uh, just to throw this out there nobody wants to get involved with you screaming at some poor cashier all right nobody's gonna back you up because you're not in the right I'm a partially sighted guy, but I try not to use my stick as I want to keep my independence for as long as possible. However, one look at my eyes and you can see the damage to them. Because of this, I often sit in the priority seating just so I can get out of the door easily and close enough to see the train door. I currently live in Japan and the train system is really easy to use and I appreciate the way Japan supports people in my position by having such seating. So a few years ago, I'm sat in my seat when this old Japanese Karen comes up and just stabs me in the chest with her stick. She shouts at me saying I shouldn't be sitting there and that foreigners have no respect. I lifted my head and looked at her in the eyes, wide open, so she could see my red, scarred eyes. Her reaction? She just stabbed me in the chest again with her stick. And at this person, at this point, sorry, the person sat across, leaves the cartridge, and walked towards another one. A seat is now available, and I point to it. No reaction. I say again and gesture with my hand, and she smashes me in the chest for a third time, actually winding me. The train stops, and I decide to get off in the next train, and get on the next train because I don't want to deal with this woman. However, I notice two police entering the train, and the man who got off his seat comes back in and points at the woman. And the police end up dragging her off. We have a quick chat, and the man had apparently raised the alarm somehow with the driver and had the police on standby. I gave a quick statement to police and was allowed on my way. I'm not sure what happened to Karen, but I was very pleased to have someone stand up for me. Thank you, kind sir. Oh, this is a next level Karen, dude. Okay, imagine you get on the bus, somebody sitting in priority seating. You can ask them to move, that's fair enough. She just automatically jumps to smacking you with a stick. But on top of that, if that person then looks at you and you can see that they're partially sighted and obviously have a reason to be sitting there. You don't proceed to smack them with the stick again. The normal human reaction to asking somebody to move from priority seating and then finding out that they have a right to sit there should be embarrassment, you know, apologizing. Yeah, you're really showing everybody a lesson. Smacking blind people with sticks. You're really out here showing everybody not to mess with you. 
Hi, I work at Dairy Queen, hopefully not for much longer, and we get a lot of old Karens that drive through, but this guy, this guy was special. I had just come in from my lunch break yesterday at 3.50pm and I put on the headset. It was me and three shift managers working and one of them was taking an order, cue a male Karen, and this was the conversation I came back to hear. I want my fries and cheese curds not greasy, lady. Sure, we can't control how greasy they come out because they're being cooked in our deep fryer. I'm a certified chef! I know how to cook, and I know that they will only get greasy if you cook them in cold oil. Now you can make them how I want you to, or I can get my money back. He hasn't even paid yet, let alone ordered. Sir, our fryers temp at 350 degrees. We don't and can't cook your food in oil any colder. Listen, lady, you can take your fries and shove it, because I'll take my money elsewhere and we'll never shop here again. Okay, have a blessed day. Dude, I just love this because what do you want the minimum wage Dairy Queen workers to do? Do you think they really care if you never eat at Dairy Queen again? Oh no, oh, do, do, please come back and order our cheese curds, please. Like, the, the, what? they don't care. And on top of that, if you're Mr. Certified Chef making the greatest cheese curds to ever exist, then you should also know that ordering anything from fast food usually leads to it being fried in oil, you know? I'm just saying. And if you're a certified chef trying to roll around and eat five-star cuisine, maybe anything with a drive through is not the best option. I love me some Dairy Queen cheese curds, all right? But I don't go in there and order cheese curds expecting, like, a five-star meal. I'm aware of the fact that I'm getting mass-fried cheese curds that are just in some deep fryer in the back. Like, oh, I'm a certified chef. Well, good for you. The guy that we have flipping burgers in the back is not. So I don't know what you want him to do about it. So first, some needed context. I'm a patient screener at my local hospital. You know, one of the people at the entrance who asks a handful of annoying questions and makes sure no one's with a fever or COVID enters the hospital. It's genuinely a low-stress job, and I love it. Very little work and good pay when compared to what I actually do. And it's all been pretty damn smooth until a little under an hour ago. The way the temp setup works is there are two scanners surveying the corridor, one by the main entrance to the little hall and one behind me at the other end. The scanners display the full hall and have a cursor that follows more or one people who come down the hall to get their temperature. When too many people come through, the sensor freaks out and focuses on one person and gives no temperatures for anyone else. I'm the only patient screener on my shift, so if I go to the bathroom or take lunch, the desk is empty. So when I came back to my desk to resume working after eating my lunch and just disinfecting myself a little, there's a group of women at the other end of the hall talking. Two of the four of them are in direct alignment with the sinners and standing directly in front of the door. For a while, there was no issue, no one coming through the doors, and they weren't really doing much but being a little loud. After about 20 minutes, a rush of visitors, healthcare workers, and patients started coming through, and the two women wouldn't move out of the way of the door, and the temp scanner started doing its freakout thing. So when everyone had passed through and the five of us were alone, I said to the two, Hey, can you move out of the way of the door? People aren't able to get through, and having you by the sensors is messing with me getting their temperatures. The main woman, I guess, I don't know, tried to make excuses saying the room was hot and that's what's messing with the scanners, so why are we telling them to move and a bunch of other excuses. I only just asked them to move a little bit off to the side. The hall is small and there was more than enough space to just move out of the way and not be picked up by the sensors or be in front of the door. Apparently that was a little bit too much for her. Go back to your little desk, leave us alone, and I'm not moving. We're pretty much the only thing said by her in increasing tone and an apparent I'm gonna hit you posture. After a few minutes of that, I just said get out or I'll call security. So they left to go into the ER on the other side of the entrance door. After 10 minutes, they passed through again with the same lady staring at me as I'm going through questions with a visitor. And about 15 minutes after that, they passed back through again towards the ER once more and this time she maintained to eye contact the entire time. I know it's fairly normal for Karens to lose it over anything, but a door? Really? I always thought that level of Karenicity was pettiness and borderline, or a level of Karenicity and pettiness was borderline impossible. That's a good one, Karenness. They really had a whole hospital to go stand in, and they picked right in front of the temperature sensor that blocks a door. 
At that point, it's either a lack of self-awareness that's so severe that, you know, you've got to tell them, or they're doing it on purpose, and which one of those is worse? Go back to your little desk. Dude, I'm just asking you to please move out of the way so when I go back to my little desk, I can actually do my job, all right? I also love how they tried to blame the room being hot for why it wasn't working. Like, no, the human body is usually about 98 degrees temperature-wise. I'm sure that standing two inches away is nothing compared to the room being a bomby 76. Like, come on, even if the room is 80 degrees, it's not even the same thing as having a person stand right in front of it. Did you go to medical school, Karen? Did you design the temperature machine? That's what I thought. I don't think so. There's nothing wrong with not being an expert. That's what Karens don't get, dude. Like, listen, if I was at the hospital and someone told me I was messing with a sensor, I would just trust them. Because I don't work in a hospital. Why the hell would I know how any of this stuff works? I arrive at work about an hour after our doors open and notice a fleet vehicle in front of the building for a company that I will refer to as Bad Customer. The employee of Bad Customer is in the lobby and is visibly agitated talking to the two employees that work for my company. Sue and Bob are both very good at their jobs, very smart and competent people who I trust. I have a very low tolerance for customers being rude to my staff. Their jobs are hard enough as it is and they don't need rude customers making their day worse. So Jerkface is saying things like, this is ridiculous, why don't you know how to do your job, blah, 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 blah. And Sue is definitely flustered and on the phone with our corporate office and Bob is trying to help another customer. I stand by Sue to try and gather the details while she talks to corporate and see what needs to happen and what I can do to help. It turns out that Bad Customer had falsely claimed to have a corporate account with our company, and Jerkface was demanding to receive our product and service without payment and that we should send them an invoice to be paid later. Sue verifies that no such account exists and that we require payment up front to do business with Bad Customer. This upsets Jerkface very, very much, and he starts making phone calls to people in his company and is very loudly, deliberately making a scene that is disturbing other customers. As I approach him, he is discussing how ridiculous this is and how long they've been in business and how much money they spend not an impressive amount and false as well and how they will take their business elsewhere he stopped his conversation and put his phone on speaker as i walked up and holds out the phone like i'm gonna take it and talk to his boss i looked him dead in the eye and told him to pay up front now or get out Pure shock on his face as he stammers out, well, that's not very user-friendly. He said he didn't have a corporate credit card. Guess what? Not our problem. Don't care. Pay up or hit the bricks, pal. His boss ended up giving us their corporate card over the phone, and he goes on his way, grumbling on his way out of the door. You would think that would have been enough to end the story, right? Nope. Jerkface decided to call our corporate office to complain about a rogue manager that was completely unprofessional. Now the folks he called at corporate are working at a call center and none of them have the power to resolve the complaint. They turn those things over to managers such as myself since we have the authority to fix it. Any real complaints anyone could have here go through me. Since he was intending to lodge a complaint about a manager, he correctly asked to be connected with my manager. But as luck was have it, I was the only one involved in this situation because the manager that works for me was on vacation and I was there to run his part of the business while he was away. So being the next manager up in the chain, the phone call comes to me and I quickly realized I was talking to Jerkface again and he realized he was talking to me as I explained to him for the second time, we won't be doing business with bad customer without payment up front and he hung up before I could finish my sentence. Dude, this is arguably the stupidest one of the entire video because this is how this went down. This guy walked into this business, you need to do this work and charge my corporate account and we have a corporate account so charge it i'm not paying right now you guys are ridiculous the lady looks it up they don't have a corporate account there's nothing to charge right so if i can't charge your corporate account then i need money up front because otherwise you're gonna leave and like there's no way for me to get my money and he just keeps demanding that they charge an account that doesn't exist like what do you want them to do bro harry potter flick of the wrist make it exist i don't necessarily think that's how corporate accounts work dude the most embarrassing part is him having a loud phone call in the lobby with the other customers. We spend so much money here, only for it to be like not a lot of money. $10,000 is a crap ton of money, you know, but it's not a lot of money if you're buying like fleet vehicles, you know, if you're buying 30 trucks at a time, 10 grand isn't a lot. I bet you nothing in the world felt better when this guy called corporate expecting to, you know, get this manager in trouble. Maybe even get him fired. Who knows what he was going for here, only to get redirected right back to his phone. I told you, I am the manager. You, like, feel him shaking from the other side of the phone. 
So my younger brother, who was 12, got an Xbox Series S as a gift from my mom this Christmas, and he was so happy and thanked my mom profusely. My cousin, who's 10, walked over and tried to take the Xbox away from my brother, and my mom told my cousin that this was my brother's gift, not his. And he responded with, Mommy, can I have it? And my mom pulled the cousin back away from my brother in the least violent way. And my aunt said, How dare you touch my child? My mom said, Well, he was trying to take my kid's gift. And after a bit of bickering, my granddad, who is known for his short temper, ended up just leaving and going and went to his and my grandma's. My mom said that my aunt should learn how to discipline her kid, and my aunt said that my mom should stop raising an entitled brat. And my grandma ended kicking up both of them out until they calmed down, and they stayed in their cars on the driveway for the rest of the party and left. To this day, they still fight about the incident. This story is one of the hundreds of others I have. Should I post another one? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, dude. If this is just a normal run-of-the-mill family reunion for you, then my goodness, I don't think a Reddit thread's enough. We need, like, a reality show. This is the type of drama I've been missing. For real though, imagine being a little kid who had like just gotten an Xbox and then all of a sudden your cousin comes over and starts trying to take it. Nah, I would have expected my mom to get involved too, bro. This is my Xbox. If your parents loved you, they would have given you one. That was obviously a joke, but you know, I have a very spoiled cousin who was doing similar stuff, so uh, my patience for it's pretty out at this point. What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am. Today we're going to be reacting and reading some of these uh, entitled kid stories I ended up finding on Reddit. You guys have really loved the Reddit videos lately. They've been banging so I figured I would do another one but you know before we get into it be sure to press the like button and comment spoiled down below or you're gonna end up like this and without further ado let's get into some crazy stories. This is sort of a mix between a rant, petty revenge, and entitled kid story, but bear with me. For some context, this story goes back to some years ago while me and my brother was still in our late teens and going out all the time. I don't particularly have a good relationship with him because of past issues, so my brother would always love to use my laptop since he broke his to do stuff like chat with his friends or play on it for hours on end. I would normally be fine with this, but then he started treating my laptop like it was his own and would lock himself in his room with it and refused to let me use it even though I needed it. Mostly for school and because I actually wanted to use my laptop for once. Our rooms are next to each other and I knew he had been up all night because he had been awake and talking right before I went to bed and I still heard him talking when I woke up the next day. He never takes anything seriously and I always have to help him or else my parents guilt trip me to help my brother because of brotherly love. He doesn't even want to try to learn anything and it's basically just me giving him the answers and going on with our days. On this particular day though, I came to find out that he had a very important assignment to complete at home. Not like he was passing to begin with. Anyways, he had to complete it and I very sneakily went into his room and simply took my charger to hide between my mattress and bed frame. I quickly checked to see what percentage my laptop was at and waited for him to return after being yelled at at my parents to complete his work and come to me for help if he needs it. I pretended I was having a headache and very sick and needed to rest. My computer died and my brother started looking for my charger. He barged into his room and asked if I'd seen his charger. I told him no and told him not to come back because I had a headache and he supposedly started getting frustrated on the other side because I could hear fast and exaggerated breathing. All of a sudden I heard thumping and needless to say he failed his assignment and it was only after he came back from school the next day that I gave him the charger. Unfortunately, it has a bad ending because he went straight to my parents and told on me and I got grounded for a month, but it was still worth it. Bro, nothing is worse than like being nice and trying to share somewhat something with somebody and then them like treating it like it's theirs now and just acting like it's not yours in the first place. Give me my charger, bro. All right, dog, it's my laptop. And it's funny that you're gonna fail your assignment because I've got my charger. Wild how that works, isn't it? I really don't know if a month of being grounded is a solid trade-off here. You know, I'm not an expert at that anymore. I'm just saying letting your brother fail one assignment and getting grounded for a month doesn't seem like a good trade. But your brother sounds like he sucks. I mean, I'll give you that. This happened a few years ago when I was working as a para-pro at an elementary school and I still think of it often. I don't know if I'd called him an entitled kid, maybe troubled, but his mother did baby him quite a bit. Enough to come onto the playground in the morning threatening staff members to not mess with her baby. The mother refused to talk to the principal when there was an issue but would try to break into the school to confront certain teachers and the mom's behavior is probably part of the reason Nathan acts the way he did. I was in the computer lab when I heard a commotion in the hallway. I poked my head out 
out and saw an entire first grade class cautiously staring into the room. I could hear a boy screaming and throwing things, and the teacher was on the phone with the secretary in hopes of getting back up. Knowing the class and the students, I instantly knew who it was. I'm not sure what Nathan's home life is like or if he's ever been diagnosed with anything, but he could snap without warning. I asked the teacher what the situation was and she wasn't sure. Nathan just started going crazy. And she also said if I wanted to try to talk to him to go for it. I was unable to get Nathan to come into the computer lab and hopes he'd calm down. Or was able to, sorry. And he ended up playing a few games while muttering to himself. At one point, I figured he'd chilled out enough to explain why he went off. Turns out, they were sitting on their spots on the carpet watching a video, and Maggie turned around and smiled at Nathan. That was it. Honestly, Maggie was a little bit of a mean kid, but she idolized Nathan. Nathan took the smile the wrong way. Why was she looking at me? Why did she smile? She's planning something. I could see it. I could see it. She wanted to kill me. She wanted me dead. That's when I noticed what he was doing on the computer. He was in an art program writing, Maggie's the devil. The secretary popped her head into the lab and quietly asked me to bring Nathan to the front office so he could take a nap. Now, taking him there started out fine, and Nathan realized as we were getting closer to the principal after we rounded the corner that led to the main office. The principal's a nice dude, but he could exercise demons with his glare, and he knew we would have to have a chat with the principal soon. He started pulling on my arm, pleading, I don't want, or I want to go back to the lab. I won't cause trouble anymore. He got so violent with tugging on my arm that he ended up injuring my shoulder and back. I did my best to bite my tongue so I wouldn't curse due to the pain, and he started to call me racist, screaming that I hit him, even though he's the one literally grabbing me, that I'm a horrible person, a mix of every insult he could think of. We got close enough to the office that the principal could hear him. The principal shouted his name and he knew it was game over. He let me go slowly but steadily made it to the office without another word. I want to make a note that at no point did I physically touch him to make him go to the office. He was literally grabbing onto me. I also stopped engaging in the chat with him. Once he starts to go off, he will not listen. If anything, he sees it as an opening to negotiate. I found that if I silently walked, he would continue to follow. I would have continued to listen and talk things out, except they didn't want me in the office. There's no surprise that his mom didn't end up coming in, and Nathan was assigned to spend more time with the school counselor. He wrote me a note saying he's sorry about hurting me, and I was surprised surprised when they posted an assignment outside their classroom. It had questions and answers so they could practice their writing, and his answer to his favorite teacher was me. It's been a few years since I quit, and I'm hoping he's doing better and has found some clarity, and I still think back to his daily tantrums, and that's definitely one of his worst meltdowns. Honestly, wherever you're at, Nathan, dude, I hope you're doing good. I hope everything worked out, you know? I just gotta hope that this shoulder injury wasn't permanent. Imagine having your shoulder, like, permanently affected, and every time you go to throw a ball, damn you, Nathan. Nathan, damn you! Seriously, though, uh, I hope Nathan ended up getting everything worked out, dude. This is why I have no desire to, like, ever be a teacher ever in my entire existence. Kudos to the people that do it. Like, I know society needs it, but I'm not having to, like, I'm not trying to have to fight crazy kids. I'm just not down. These kids kept following us because we refused to buy candy from them. Not anything too interesting, but I figured this fits here, and we got away from him, and this happened three hours ago. My friend and I, who are currently at the beach, decided to leave the apartment to go on a walk and talk with each other. We didn't go anywhere besides the ice cream store, so we were either walking or sitting down by the side having ice cream. On the way back, two kids holding boxes with candy were in front of us. One of them was like 13 to 15 and the other one was 10, maybe 12. When we passed by them, they asked us if we wanted any candy, but we said no, with my friend saying we didn't have any money. I should probably note that the younger one honestly sounded like he was kind of on drugs when he was talking. I assume he was just making that weird voice because, well, if he really was only 10 or 12, then it's explanatory. What do you expect from a kid that old? Here's the thing, though. Even after we refused, they just kept following us, insisting on us buying the candy, saying stuff like, we're not gonna steal from you. Why are you guys so scared of us? The younger one even said he was gonna cut our heads off. I took a look at him to see if he had a knife or anything, but he didn't, at least not on his hands. My friend got so fed up he just said you guys do realize that you're following us at this point right the older one just gave a smart response saying we're not following you we're just going that direction they didn't seem like they were walking that way when we passed by them until we refused to buy any candy my friend stopped walking and i did the same and after that said all right if you say so then keep walking 
unfortunately they did with us staying still for a two seconds and then going down another sidewalk trying to get away. Do you want to buy my candy bar? No, I'm gonna cut your head off. Dude, I don't understand why you guys are being so weird and acting afraid of us. Like, come on, it's not like we're gonna hurt you or anything. I also feel like if you're like, hey, do you want to buy some candy and someone says no, and then the first thing you do is go, I'm not gonna steal from you. It's like, uh, I, I mean, I didn't think you were gonna steal from me. I did just think you were trying to sell me candy, but like, it's super weird that you're trying to convince me you're not stealing from me, so now I think you might. It's like you just meet a guy, you know, Jerry at the barbecue. He's like, hey man, nice to meet you. I didn't kill my ex-wife. Okay, Jerry, I don't know you or your ex-wife, but uh, are you a person of interest by chance? So this is my first post here, so wish me luck, and there might be some spelling error, so don't get too mad, I Let's set the scene. We're in a rec room art contest, which was started by a YouTuber about herself, and it ends and the art gets judged and the results come in. A person gets third place. He was a pretty cool kid who we'll get back to later. I came in second, and some random dude got first. The creator of the contest made a video on what was submitted for the contest, and this entitled kid submitted three things that he said took him nine hours to make, while the person who got third made one map, and this kid was basically going off to the person who came in third that his art was better than his map, and that, you know, he's gonna win. Anyways, when the results came back, the entitled kid was pretty pissed off when none of his submissions won, and that person's map won third. He was so mad that he went to the comments of the video saying, I'm sad I didn't win with all my entries that took me nine hours. I think almost all of them are better than third. And he starts talking about how third place is the worst looking one out of all the submissions. So after this, he posts in the Discord of the YouTuber pretty much the exact same thing, and people started to get mad at him. Me and the person who came in third actually had a talk about how rude and bratty the kid was because he didn't win. I'm thinking of talking to the owner of the server to see if we can ban him and also talk with him in game to give him a piece of my mind. I mean, I don't think you need to get him banned from the server, bro. He just thinks he should have won. If anything, keep letting him look petty. That's a better victory. I should have won. My art was so much better than everybody who was art. And I'm a winner. I really am. Like, if anything, bro, you don't ban him. You don't tell him to stop. You just keep letting him go off about how he should have won the contest and the person who came in third sucks. Because everybody's gonna look at that and be like, ah, you're mad. You're mad. Kid starts pushing me and trying trying to break my arm in a nerf arena because I shot him. Backstory, it was my sister's birthday and I got bored, so we all went to a nearby nerf arena to kill some time. There was a kid who was already there, and at first he was pretty neutral. There were a lot of people, not that it matters. Anyways, a lot of people left, and it was just me and this kid left, and he started pushing me around, grabbing my gun, literally trying to break my arm and call me an idiot. Anyways, all of this started because I had shot him with a nerf gun, which is what you're supposed to do. Remember, it's a nerf arena. And when pushing me and trying to break my arm didn't work, he started calling me names. And so I just started shooting him with the nerf gun, and he ended up leaving. His dad didn't say anything, but looked pretty embarrassed, even though his kid was complaining about it the entire time. They ended up leaving a bit later with him crying. Genuine question to the dude who was rolling around trying to break people's arms in the nerf arena. Like, if you did succeed, hypothetically, you're like, Oh, you shot me in our nerf war, I'll get you for that. You run up to him, you snap his arm in half, dude, blood blood shooting everywhere, bone sticking out. Like, what now? Like, now you're just the dude that shattered somebody's arm over a nerf war. I don't feel like that's exactly something very cool. He's gonna go to school. Don't mess with me. I shattered a guy's entire tibia because of the fact that he blasted me in a nerf war. Ungrateful cousin loses his luggage and laptop and blames his parents. My cousin, a few times removed, can be said to be a pampered one and grew up in a house where everything's done for him. The only thing his parents can be expecting from him was to study and get a degree. This culminated in him eventually getting into a British university. His parents accompanied him to England to check him into university, arrange for his accommodation, banking, dorm room, furnishing, etc. The only thing he didn't get was a car as the dad refused to allow him to drive and the parents flew back after all that. At the term end, my cousin had to vacate his rented dorm rooms. The parents flew to London and told him to take a bus to the hotel. The way the story was told to me, my cousin had two suitcases and a backpack pack. In his wisdom, he decided to pack his laptop into the suitcase along with his passport. He went to the bus terminal to catch the express to his parents. 
Apparently, my cousin approached the bus at the terminal and placed his two suitcases next to the bus before boarding and fell asleep. What he should have done was go to the storage side of the bus where the bus driver was waiting and loaded the suitcases himself with the bus driver ensuring that nobody would steal the luggage. After the journey ended, my cousin realized that his luggage was not there, obviously misplaced or stolen. He wasn't upset, frustrated, or worried. No, he was angry. Angry because his parents didn't pick him up from his dorm, didn't hold his hand and carry his suitcase for him, angry he had to do all those things himself. He stormed his way to the hotel and instead of being remorseful for losing his luggage and laptop, proceeded to have a meltdown in the hotel lobby berating his parents for making him lose his laptop and passport that he stupidly placed in his suitcase instead of backpack. The worst part was his mother apologizing profusely to the son the entire time. The father wasn't having it though, and as I learned later, he let his fury out at my entitled cousin in the hotel room for being careless, and getting a return passport was absolutely a hassle. Getting a passport is a hassle enough, dude. I couldn't imagine trying to do all of that in a different country, and I also couldn't imagine screaming at my parents because I messed up. Wow, what do you mean the guy who drives the bus didn't load my luggage for me? This is somehow your fault, Mom, it's like, yeah, dude, this isn't that type of bus. The guy driving the bus ain't gonna load it for you, pal. And on top of that, even if he was supposed to, how do your parents have any control over the guy driving the bus? So I work for a big name shipping company. We have workers ranging in age from 18 to 33. And where I work, we load trailers that go from city to city. I get along well with everyone except one guy that we're gonna call Chad. Honestly, I can't even believe a person like him exists. Chad is the most pathetic human being I've ever met in my life. I'm full-time and Chad's a part-time worker. He's also 28 and I'm 30. Here's how he's pathetic though. And more I think of him, the more pathetic he is. He still lives with his parents, again, 28 years old, and he calls off two to three days a week refusing to work more than 15 hours a week despite the fact that he's again 28 years old. A few months ago, we were backed up with orders due to a spike in volume and our employer asked everyone to work extra hours whenever they could. Everyone, including college kids, did, except Chad. Chad always complained, saying, They can fire me if they want, but that's BS, because they want me to work more than 15 hours. Usually, everyone ignores it because it's not worth it. Well, anyways, we got a new manager I'll call Jen. We also had a new wing manager we'll call Jim. Jim and Jen were very awesome. They were cool and willing to work with you as long as you tell them the truth. Well, Jim starts asking Chad to work extra hours, to which Chad makes up the worst excuses in the world. Usually because, like, I can't because I have to watch my neighbor's cat, or I can't because I'm busy. Eventually, Jim and Jen have none of this and start calling Chad out on his crap. One day, Chad loses it when he's asked to do a task he doesn't like and walks out of the building. Me and a few others notice and we let Jed know and Jen thanked us. He was issued a warning that if he ever did it again, he'd be fired. His response was, whatever, fire me, I'll go work for Amazon. At this, Jen was like, whatever. Fast forward to the next week and he's again asked to do a task he doesn't like and walked out again. He got reported and Jen is told from Jim to go ahead and fire him. We all think he's fired and we start making fun of him and he's the laughing stock of the dock. He gets the notice he's fired. Now why is this here you might ask? Here's why. A few days later we see Chad back in the factory. This time with his mom and dad. Again, 28. Yeah, that's right. A 28-year-old brought his parents to defend him. And we're all thinking, what's going on? Jim and Jen are called to a meeting with the factory head, Alex. The meeting has Alex, Jen, Jim, Chad, and his parents. I was told later how the meeting went from Jen. Chad's parents demanded that we give his job back and that Jen be fired. Luckily, Jen was prepared, and she and Jim both showed documents stating Chad walked out of the factory. The first time he did it, he signed, acknowledging that he would be fired if he did it again. Mom and dad are not happy. You see, Chad went home and told his parents he was fired because he refused to work extra hours and threw five people under the bus saying they didn't either. Alex sees the document and asks Jen, do you have witnesses that he walked off the dock? And Jen says, yeah, a few. Alex declares that Chad was fired reasonably and isn't going to get his job back. But he says, I need this job. He was basically told, oh well. Anyways, his parents was upset because they realized they failed him. I'm not what sure what happened to Chad, but he never came back. 
I still can't believe it happened. So if anyone here thinks they're pathetic, just remember Chad is a 28 year old who brought his parents to work to keep him from getting fired and still got fired. Honestly, Chad, uh, that was not a very Chad move, bro. I've got a feeling that Amazon's gonna want you to work a little bit more than 15 hours a week too, dude. That's like not a whole lot. I feel like finding people that are cool with that when you're 28 are, are very hard to find. Then again, you know, I don't know what it's like. I also feel like uh, walking off the job is definitely a reason you're going to get fired. Imagine his being his parents there, dude, only to find out that, like, your son is just actually dumb and just walked off the job, and that's why he got fired instead of what he told you. Karen on a plane. I was on an airplane and right when we landed, a Karen in the back unbuckled and darted to the front of the plane to get off first. She did not make any eye contact and felt she was special. I'm talking about going from the very last seat on the plane down the whole row and past first class basically standing at the little kitchen thing in the front. All this time, the seatbelt sign was on and we're still rolling down the runway. The flight crew had asked her to return to her seat until we reached the gate, but she wasn't even replying. Everyone was basically trying to just wait it out because it was a long flight, over eight hours, and at this point we were exhausted and no one said a word. Suddenly, the captain announced we had a special guest on board and he will be coming out to greet after we were settled at the plane. The Karen stood there awkwardly and we did the whole rolling to the gate and whatever planes do when they land for about 20 20 minutes. Everyone sat there waiting to see what the captain was talking about. Eventually, the captain came out and asked the lady to please move back a little to get to his special guest, and then a little more, and then a little more. He was looking from row to row trying to find a specific person, and everyone is watching and looking around to see who it could be. He kept going and going and asking the Karen to please take a few more steps back each time. Finally, as they approached the rear of the plane, he asked her to sit for a second while he grabbed the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce our special guest sitting in seat 42C. Let's give her a round of applause. The whole plane was wild with laughter and applause, and I loved every moment of it. These are the worst type of people on a plane. Literally everyone wants to get up and run off Karen. No one's happy to have just been sitting there for eight hours. But, you know, there's a process, and uh, you kind of got to let the plane off in the the order that people are getting off. You don't just get to skip the line because you're the princess of the show. What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am and today we're going to be taking a look at the subreddit Petty Revenge because you guys tend to really like these videos and uh, you know I make them. So uh, without further ado let's get into it. Don't help with the group project? Fine. Fail the class. Don't get promoted at work. So this happened a few semesters ago. I'm a big history buff, always have been. Part of this history class was a group project where we had to pick a year of American history sometime during the 1800s and do a presentation on all major events of the year. I was known in the class for being a history buff and I partially feel this led to the group dynamics that we had. I feel like my group members basically thought, oh, we got Sun Don't Play and he's gonna ace this for us. Well, the project started and the group became non-responsive, all three of them. We had a discussion board where we were supposed to talk in and none of them responded. We had emails and none of them responded. We had a chat group and none of them responded. After numerous attempts, I went to my professor and complained and my professor said he'd sent out a notice to all the students they needed to participate to get credit. So rinse and repeat, I tried again and this time two people replied. One was Ashley and she made a half attempt to it setting up and figuring out what year we were going to cover. And another was Scott and he needed his bachelor's to get promoted and it was literally his last semester. Ashley ignored the time we set aside and Scott said, hey, I'm busy, this seems easy, I think it's you who's leading the charge. To which I said, fine, let's do XYZ year and you can find me some academic sources to use in the project. Scott responded, responded that he was busy but he'd try. I went to the professor and he said he'd speak to each student individually. I don't know if he did or not but the result results were the same. Finally, I went to my professor and he said, do the project and anyone that helps and puts their name on the project, all grade accordingly. So over the course of the two weekends, I knocked out the project by myself. It was a pretty fun project and I enjoyed doing it, so it wasn't all that bad. And when I finished a rough draft, I thought I'd throw out one more lifeline. I emailed the group project to my group and CC'd the professor. In the email, I said, I completed the project. I need someone to clean up the citations. I need another person to do the graphics and I need another person to proofread it and let me know what I can do. And two people replied. One was another member of the group, let's call Tom, who said, I think the graphics look fine, which, you know, there were no graphics, which means he never opened it. Another was Scott, who said he'd clean up the citations. None of them did anything, and I figured they wouldn't, and now this class was broken down into six grading components. Discussions were 10%, quizzes were 15, midterm papers another 15, the midterm test another 15, the final test 15%, and our final project 30%. 
Therefore, it was nearly impossible to pass the class without doing the final project. So I completed it and submitted it a week before the deadline. And two days before the project was due, all three of the group members reached out to me asking if I had submitted it. I said I had and it was a good project and I'm sure it'd be graded well and they're all happy to hear it. Professor graded the project and gave me a 95%, which I was happy about. The professor also wanted to clarify what contributions that I get from the rest of my classmates. My response, none of them helped. I decided to inform the group of my good grade and they were all so happy. Many so confident that they were guaranteed to pass the class. Well, everyone else on my group got a zero because they didn't help. And all three of my group members were really pissed off. Especially Scott, because Scott needed to pass the class to get promoted at work and he needed a bachelor degree and this was one of the last credits he needed. I remember the call between Scott and I. You didn't put my name on the project? No. Sure didn't. Why not? He demanded. Because you didn't help at all. In his defense, he fired back that he was busy with work, to which I fired back. We all have lives, and I also have a job, a wife, and a baby. I don't need your excuses. To which he advised me since he failed the class and he wasn't going to get promoted at work and the promotion was really important to him. To which I said, if the promotion was important to you, you should have helped with the project, but apparently it wasn't as important as you claim. Ashley and Tom were both upset, but less so. Maybe they learned a lesson, and after all, isn't that what college is about? Learning. I mean, it's not like he gave him 700 chances to make it right. He even submitted it and said, look, someone clean up the citations just real quick, okay? You can you can get a decent grade. If they chose not to even open the presentation or double check it at all and make sure that their name was on it, then that's kind of on them, right? You know, petty? Sure, a little bit. But at the same time, I think everybody knows if you're going to be in a group project and one person's going to do most of the work, you at least have to pretend that you're paying attention to it and help them out when they need something. Force me to stay longer at work and not pay me? Fine, I'll ruin your business for a day. About a year ago, I was a waitress at a family-owned diner. It was Mother's Day and a Sunday, so you can imagine how busy it was. The diner had 12 tables and I was the only actual waitress, and normally, my boss, the owner, would be helping me with tables on busy days. I show up to work and already people are in the diner waiting to be served. My boss is nowhere to be seen and I was stressed out because it was just me and the cook. No dishwasher or busser. Within an hour, the restaurant was packed and I was responsible for serving everyone, taking up orders, picking up orders on the phone, managing online orders, cleaning the dishes, and bussing the tables, all 12, all by myself. I called my boss asking her where she was and she didn't pick up. After five hours, my shift was about to end and the restaurant was still packed and I call my boss and she finally answered. I asked her what time she was coming in as my shift was almost over and the restaurant is packed. And the woman had the nerve to say, can you stay for two more hours? I had a doctor's appointment I forgot. I'm sorry. I calmly told her that my shift ends at one, so I'm letting you know someone needs to be here to take orders and she begged me to say and says she has no one to be there. I almost felt bad but this woman had made me stay 15 to 20 minutes after my shift ended and not paid me for those minutes so I hung up and walked out. The next day my boss was furious with me and asked why I thought my behavior was professional and then I reminded her that I had obligations outside of work and I couldn't stay longer because she had forgotten her to manage her time right. I was tempted to tell her I had a doctor's appointment too but alas I did not. Surprisingly, I wasn't fired. There were angry customers, lots of meals comped, and the cook closed the diner temporarily. But I was the only worker who kept that diner running, so she had no choice but to keep me. A few months ago, I put in my two weeks notice and my boss begged me to stay to the weekend. Told me, no, you have to work weekends here. I need you here. And I told him, unfortunately, I'll be working at my new job during that time, so I won't be available on weekends. Even though I put in my notice for two weeks, I ditched after a week and blocked her on everything, and I now make twice as much at a much easier job. I don't really understand what they expected you to do. You ran the entire restaurant by yourself for an entire packed shift, and they were like, nah, just stay two more hours. I forgot my doctor's appointment. Sounds like you also forgot how you're supposed to be running a business. I don't know. If this diner's making it so you can pay your rent, you probably won't be able to pay rent a whole lot longer. He said I needed to keep the desk tidy, and I took that personally. This happened nearly five years ago when I had first become a concierge at a high-rise condominium. I originally worked in the management office, helping pick up the slack since the office was and still is overworked and understaffed. This is par for the course as the entire building is understaffed, including of course the concierge position. At the time, it was only the weekend shift that needed to be filled and it was given a pay raise to fill on Sunday morning from 7am to 3.30 time. The shifts are pretty simple, morning and afternoon, and a night shift worked in with simple work to answer phones, coordinate valets, valet cars, and other simple tasks. 
I have it incredibly easy because Sunday is pretty much dead, especially since the majority of the residents are retired. Two things I was very good about were my logs, which were very clear and concise, and the cleanliness of the desk. However, not too long after I started working as a concierge, Terry, the weekday morning shift concierge, who I would relieve for his lunch break, began to feel threatened by me as I could easily keep on top of residents, guests, contractors, packages, and cars without issue. It was one day I was working during the week that Terry commented when he came in on Monday that the desk was a mess. Mind you, I worked the morning shift on Sunday and I had no control, nor was am or am I responsible for the concierge desk before or after me. Still, I was irritated he commented on the desk being a mess like it was my fault. So when next Sunday rolled around, I went ahead and did my usual tidying up, but I extended it to cleaning out and organizing the drawers, throwing out old trash and the like, and I found a gold mine. I didn't realize it immediately, but I found a giant stash of business card from Lord knows how many people. I knew Terry was the one who had collected them all, but he was the one who said I needed to keep the desk tidy, so I did what anyone seeking petty would revenge would do and threw away the nearly 400 business cards. You know, I would be pretty upset if someone threw away my collection of business cards if I had one, but I could also understand being upset that somebody's threatened by you and is like low-key threatening your cleanliness. Overall, I think uh, you and Terry just got some stuff to work out because I don't know if this whole co-worker thing is gonna work if y'all keep doing this stuff. No drinks on raised surfaces? Okay. I work in a car detailing shop who has just gotten a new manager a few weeks ago. She has instituted multiple arbitrary new rules, but the worst of all them all is this. Throughout the day, I share a desk with multiple other people, and the desk is used to cash clients out, to write up and print invoices, and to sign up new clients. However, only one person has ever clocked in to use this desk at a time. When someone is using the desk, their things are placed there, cell phone, a drink, whatever. It's always been this way because it's a desk. Sunday morning, there's a new note on the desk stating there would be no drinks on the desk because it was a raised surface, as most tables are. Here's the petty revenge. The management desk that they all share in its one raised surface is 40 feet from my desk. It had four drinks on it, and because it's a raised surface, the drinks shouldn't have been on it, so the drinks got placed on the floor. And throughout the day, I removed the drinks from raised surfaces to place them on the floor. She must have gotten tired of having to get her drink off the floor as the note had been removed. Is this an office or a kindergarten? Why are you not allowed to have drinks on raised surfaces? I'm just not really understanding what that has to do with anything. I highly doubt any customer came in and was like, oh my goodness, I was going to do business at this establishment, but you have a Coca-Cola bottle three inches above sea level. Nay, I say, nay. I don't really feel like it matters, unless your employees literally can't be trusted to drink water on a table, at which point you need new employees. Almost hit me? Enjoy waiting longer. So this happened a few months ago at this point, but it's a story I think would fit here. So, a bit of a background, I live in a gated apartment complex with separate in and out gates. Coming down the drive to the entrance gate, the road splits a bit for each gate, with two islands and a small road between them that connects on two sides right on the outside of the gates. The first island has a call box for visitors to use to get someone to open the gate, and the second island has a card reader to open the gate too. But it's not unusual or uncommon for people to be lazy and rush to the exit gate rather than use the call box and wait the entry gate to open. And this is where the story begins. I was already a little later that night, around 8 p.m. my time, and I was already tired and was on my way to pick up my partner from work since they don't drive. As I'm approaching the exit gate, a woman who is trying to get the, uh, beat the gate is speeding and comes about a foot from hitting me at the gate. She has a good sense to back up and allow me to get through the gate while she backs into the small divide between the two islands I mentioned earlier. Since I'm already tired and she pushed my last button for the night, I decided that I was gonna be petty. So I got out of the way of the gate and just stopped and waited and waited until I saw the gate beginning to close and making sure that no one's coming behind me. The lady finally caught on to what was happening and pulled around to the card reader as the gate finally got close enough to be closed to allow a car through. I looked over her at her rider as I drove away and I just saw her giving me a face and I just looked at her stone-faced and drove away. I feel like if your strategy for getting into somewhere involves rushing the exit gate, you probably need a little bit of a different strategy. They're lucky they've never been in a car crash before. I mean, honestly, I just feel like speeding through an open open exit gate is asking for an accident to happen. My mom's sweater revenge on my dad. I remember an incident of petty revenge that my mother inflicted on my father more than 50 years ago. My dad is a great guy with many wonderful qualities, but back in his younger days, he did have a bit of a vain streak and he's always been stubborn as hell. One day, my mom was out shopping and found a sweater on sale she thought he would like. Before he tried on the sweater, my dad got a look at the label and noticed she'd brought home a size large. Helen, you know I don't take a large, he protested. Bob, why don't you just try it on? I think this one will actually fit you. 
That was a non-starter. My father dug in his heels and shifted into his pompous mode, and believe me, no one ever did pompous better than my old man. The dude is a world champ at pomposity. Helen, I always wear medium, and you should know that by now. My mom was not about to get flustered. All right, Bob, I'll take it back and exchange it for a medium. My dad was pleased that he'd made his point so quickly and convincingly and walked away looking smug. My mom went straight back to the store but came home with not one, but two identical sweaters, one in size medium and one in size small. She then grabbed her sewing kit and swapped out the labels. When my dad got home, she gave him the small sweater with the medium label and then watched as he struggled to get his head through the collar. Does that fit better, Bob? Much better, Helen. Thank Thank you, he answered, with his eyes bugging out of his head and the sweater gaped open over his belt. Dad wore the sweater around for a while that day, but I don't remember if he ever wore it again. But one thing I can be sure of, he was not about to admit that maybe this sweater actually was a little bit snug. My mom was not normally one for extravagance, but I'm pretty sure just having the story to share with a few trusted confidence was very much worth the price of two clearance sale sweaters. She passed away five years ago, but my dad is still around and sharp as an almost new tack at age. 99, and I wonder if the time has come to let him in on the stunt, or if he'd get all pompous at me for confronting him with the truth that he actually once did need a size large. No sense in rushing things. I'll wait a few more years to make sure. Man, is someone cutting onions in here? I didn't realize that petty revenge was gonna make me feel so sweet at the very end of the day. Your mom sounds awesome, and your dad sounds very stubborn. Seriously, though, dude, I, I hope one day to have a sweater moment with the missus. Seriously, though, on that note, guys, uh, I think that's gonna do it for the video. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did enjoy the video, I would appreciate you taking a second to press the like button. Let me know in the comment section down below what you thought. And of course, subscribe if you're new. Turn on those notifications. If you really want to help me out, you could use code SCRUBBY at the G Fuel checkout. And I also do post these on my Spotify. You can find a link down below if you want to listen offline without gameplay, whatever floats your boat. But uh, yeah, on that note, guys, that'll do it. Don't get anyone pregnant. If you do, make sure they're hot. And I'll see you guys next time. I'm out. Peace.